This is family right here. This is family. So good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements that I've been asked to make. Uh, the Faulkners, Bill and Frankie Faulkner, uh, retired IMB missionaries, have brought some forms uh, to help the children of missionaries who are coming back to the states to go to college. And uh, I think, are they back there with you, Linda? The forms are on the table, maybe. Uh, it says NK Retreat. In uh, I don't have anything like that. Uh, don't anything like that. Retreat Donation Farm. It's uh, you can any amount of money that you give will help them as they're getting their supplies, bedding, uh, water, snack times, uh, anything. So if you're interested in doing that, there's some forms there on the table. Uh, Beverly gave me, or she put some of these IMB prayer points back there that mention needs of uh, some of our missionaries all around the world. Uh, so these are really special things to have as you pray. Uh, let's see, what else was I to mention here? I believe that's all. Uh, as, the, as the pastor was talking this morning about giving the illustration about the footprints, about the little boy putting his, his feet where the father had in the mud, <laughs> mother knows what I'm going to tell. As a little boy, my dad raced quarter horses. And uh, so when he would come home, that was his relaxation, was to, to get on a horse and go for a ride. And we always wanted to go with him. And uh, it, as a young boy, we lived in East Texas in a little town called Currens near Corsicana, where it's black land. And they had lots of cotton patches and things like that. And uh, so Daddy, uh, my older brother Bruce and I are about four and five. and. Daddy got saddled up a horse, he was going to go on a ride, and we begged him, oh, please, can we go? No, you can't go. Stay here. Please, please, can we go? No. So Daddy started out, there had just been a big rain out in this black land, so Daddy started out in the cotton patch, and we thought, well, maybe if we follow him out there, he'll see that we have to have a ride back. <laughs> but uh, we stepped... We stepped in that black mud, and if you know what it does, you don't just pull your feet up. You pull up, your foot gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if you can even get your feet up. And we thought we were in quicksand, so we started, because we'd seen the cartoons where the, the people go all the way underground in the quicksand, so we start screaming, help, help, help. So uh, Daddy came back and saw us. He wasn't real pleased, and uh, he didn't give us a ride. He made us walk back home. <laughs> I thought of that when Brother Mike was sharing that illustration. But, uh, goodness, what great sermons we've been having lately. And uh, as, as Brother Mike was sharing about not letting our love grow cold and about endurance being uh, staying, staying under a heavy load as long as necessary, I thought, what a great example we have in our godly pastor. And uh, that's what I want for my life. You know, I want to finish strong, and I know you all do too. And uh, let's just go to the Lord as we begin this morning and ask that he would help us do that. And we want to remember all of our dear friends. The scripture says when, when one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. And uh, obviously we have, we have our precious Jeannie back today, and we're so glad uh, we've all been praying for you, Jeannie, and love you so much. And, of course, Jim, Jim Johnson, uh, the Tarpley family and the loss of Quentin Lamb. Uh, let's see, uh, Darnell Sims, John Lee's mother-in-law, and who was the George other? Robertson. George, George Robertson. Yeah. So uh, lots of our family members have gone on to be with the Lord, and mm -hmm. yeah, we're here to adjust, and the Lord will give us the grace to do that. But let's ask him to, to bless this morning. Lord, how we love you. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for, uh, as, as the scripture says, what is man that, who is man that you should take notice of him? And yet you do, Father. You love us. You saved us. You called us out of darkness into your glorious light to be your people, the chosen people, a people for your own possession. And Lord, you've, you have uh, caused us to be born into your family. And we do feel, Lord, 
the hurts of each other and we want to carry help carry the burdens and and help uplift those among us who need your special touch and not only today but in in many days to come uh, just as they have given it to us when it when it was our time of need father we thank you for the <coughs> the message that was brought to our hearts this morning would you just uh, cause your word to bear fruit within us lord we want we don't want our love to grow cold we want to do is as Jesus said, the things we did at first, Lord, we want to we want to pray, we want to feast on your word, we want to tell others about you, to share your love, uh, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, Lord. And uh, Father, we want to endure even when we're under hardship. Thank you for our godly pastor and staff. We ask your blessings on them. And Lord, as we... Uh, Sing this morning, may these praises be uh, a sweet aroma to your ears because they are from our hearts. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And Bill Pearson's here. I haven't asked him how he's doing, but I didn't know exactly what the procedure was, but when they told me they took what, two tablespoons of fat off his tummy, I said, he doesn't have any fat to give. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, Bill, we're so glad you're have that behind you in your back with this. Actually, the rest of that story, now that you brought it up, <laughs> is that he couldn't get enough fat off my stomach. Oh my God. I said, well, let you hear it. I showed him what I had. He said, no, that's not enough. And so he had to go back here. <laughs> and get it. So I just brag about that to all the girls. We would have gladly been numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, somebody had volunteered. Um, I'm back down to five miles an hour. Maybe less than maybe a half a mile. How slow can you go? <laughs> I know my granddaughter can crawl faster than I can walk. Okay, we're going to separate the uh, sheep from the goats today. And I'm, I'm a goat. I want the men to turn to page 437. I hope that's the right page. 437. Okay. I want the women to turn to 461. The women to 461. Okay, the men are going to ask something, and the women are going to tell them something, okay? Let's sing the first and the last stanza, guys, and then girls, you be ready, okay?
together, hymn number 55. We tell the story, now we're going to sing about the bloody story. Number 55. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, good morning. As uh, good morning, yeah. Michael alluded to this morning, it's been a, a different week in, at our church in that we had five funerals this week. And uh, our William, Jenny's husband, early in the week, and uh, Jim Johnson, who's a member of our class, his wife Betty was yesterday, and three others. Um, I. I think I've mentioned it in here before. There's a subcurrent of theology, mostly in the, the youth uh, or younger people, that uh, have, they've expressed in the song that has the words in it, at all times preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. And I hate that. I, I bitterly object to that. I, matter of fact, I don't think you can preach the gospel without words. Um, the gospel is that he, he died and he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And uh, that's something that those, those people that I alluded to, they're, what they're getting at is that we need to love people, we need to be friends with people and love them and, you know, they'll see Jesus and they'll get saved. And I disagree. Uh, we need to love them and spend time with them and, and do all of that. I have no objection to that. But if you don't tell people the gospel, they don't know how to be saved. How will they hear if they don't have a preacher, right? Is that what it says in Romans? And, and uh, I've always felt like if, if we don't open our mouths and explain the source of our strength, that it's Christ in us. If we don't explain that to people, we're we're condemning them because they're watching us as Christian people and wondering how do they get that together? How do how do they do that? I want to be like them. I'm going to muster up all of my strength and my fortitude and my self will, and I'm going to be like them. And they can't. We couldn't either until Christ came into our hearts and saved us and forgave us our sins and and now as christian people we we live because he lives in us and so uh, my little tirade about that song is because i think it's important to tell people the source of our strength and i i, I have to say i saw that all week long at these funerals this week uh, saints who have run the race and, and finished the course and who had named the name of Jesus Christ, most of them early in their, in their lives, and continued to walk with him. Uh, now, we've been studying Hebrews 11, which, as you know, it's a hall of fame, if you will. It's a, it's a long list of saints in the Bible, most of them in the Old Testament. And it would be easy for us to read these and just sort of sit back and distance ourselves and say, well, they're the heroes. That's not me. But I'm convinced the reason this chapter is in the Bible is to tell us what faith looks like for you. It's to say all of those people, uh, just like the lost people I was talking about a minute ago, you know, they, they look at somebody that's Christian, they think they mustered up all that on their own. Well, we look at these saints in the chapter in chapter 11, and we think, oh gosh, well, they're different. They were superheroes. They had all these great gifts and wonders and strengths. And that's not me. 
I'm just poor and humble little me, you know, so I'm going to put them up on a pedestal, and that's wonderful. No, that's not what the intent is of the author of, of Hebrews. The intent is uh, to show us, to show us all what a life of faith looks like. Uh, I saw that, as I mentioned, this week several times in the funerals as I learned about the lives of the people that had passed away this past week. And they're no different than what we're studying in Hebrews chapter 11. Invariably, the testimony was, at a young age, usually, not always, they were presented the gospel, they bowed their knees, and they said, Jesus, you are Lord, please come into my heart and be my personal Savior. And then they proceeded to plod and continue through life faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's who these people are in Hebrews chapter 11. We're at verse 22. We'll pick up there. It says, By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of his departure of the children of Israel, and he gave instructions concerning his bones. This is interesting because it's actually the last will and testament of Joseph. We know the story of Joseph who was sold into slavery, went into Egypt, uh, was imprisoned, was tempted by Potiphar's wife, had many things happen, but he ended up second man in the kingdom, and he saved the country by storing that grain. But in his last will and testament, he does something interesting concerning his bones. He wants his bones out of Egypt. Now, now, his father Jacob prophesied way back in Genesis 15 that the bondage of the children of Israel in Egypt was not going to last forever. They were enslaved, and it might, might have looked like it was going to last forever, but he saw an end to it, that God was going to bring them out. And Jacob, or brother Joseph, heard that from his daddy. And he's got it. And his theology rolling around in his head, he's getting old and reaching the end of his life, and he understands that the children of Israel are going to be leaving someday. Well, in this last will and testament, it seems pretty clear to surmise, he figured out that he wasn't going to make it. He wasn't going to be in the crowd going back to the Canaan land. He was going to die in Egypt. And he specified that his body, his bones, his remains would be preserved and not left in that pagan land but carried out, carried out and when the Israelites left into the promised land. You know, it was over 200 years from the time that he did this uh, last will and testament until they left <coughs> and went. That's a long time, isn't it? Two centuries. He was not buried. What's Egypt famous for? The mummies. Thank you. Somebody was right on top of that question. They were masters of embalming and creating mummies, of which some of them are still in existence today, thousands of years later. Joseph was not buried. He was embalmed, most likely in the Egyptian method, perhaps not. But when the Israelites were led out of, out of uh, Egypt by Moses, his bones were readily available. And they carried them out with him, with them and took them with them on the wilderness wanderings. It's a wonderful story. And it's a story about faith. Verse 23 tells us about Moses. It says, Moses, by faith, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. The king's command was to all the midwives, if it's a boy that a Hebrew woman has, you're to kill him. If it's a little girl, let him live. Well, the midwives were not obeying that, not practicing that. And Moses' parents, dad and mom here, it says parents, they realized, looking at this little baby boy, that God had a plan for him. Now, it says the word beautiful. That's not really getting at what the uh, intent is. It's not beautiful in the sense that you might think. It's beautiful in the sense of being marked, set aside. It's only used two times in the Bible, and both times it's used in regards to Moses. 
They realized when he was born that they had to hide him, they were not about to kill him, and they saw that God had a hand on this boy. Now, what is faith? Faith, in their, in their case, was simply recognizing what God was doing around them and cooperating with them, obeying them. They hid the child and made preparations for him to survive, as you know the story in the river. Well, as he grew up, verse 24 goes on to tell us, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That is alluding to, in Moses' adulthood, the fact that he was taken out of the Nile River, out of that little ark, uh, that little boat that was made. He was taken out of the river by the daughter of Pharaoh, who raised him in the court of Egypt in great wealth, pomp, and circumstance. He had it made. He was to be the next ruler of Egypt. He was in line with the royalty of Egypt. But as you see in verse 24 and 25, what the mark or the call of God did in his life, it said when he became of age, he refused. He said no. I see the future you have planned for me, Pharaoh, but I refuse. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and then he chose. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. That's the Hebrew people. He would rather have that than live in sin in Pharaoh's court. Now we're seeing something here that behind the scenes, although the scripture might not uh, open up and, and uh, give us details, we can see in this young man that the mark of God that his parents saw was still with him, and it was bearing on him. It was weighing on him. It was something, we don't know details, but we do know that he understood his future was to lead the Hebrew people and not to lead the Egyptian people. How God did that, I don't know. But I can see it clearly there in this system. He walked away from pleasure. He walked away from possessions. He walked away from power. He walked away from all of that and chose to side with a bunch of slaves captured in Egypt. Well, you know how that went? It didn't start out very good, did it? He interceded in a fight between two Hebrew men that were fighting. Remember that? Hebrews turned on him. Who made you to be a judge over us? Didn't start out well. And he had to flee. Verse 26 talks about Moses esteemed the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt because he looked to the reward. Now, all of these people that we've looked at in chapter 11, they all have something in common. They all did different things to have faith. They expressed their faith differently, just like it is for you. But the one thing they had in common was they did not see the promises come to fulfillment. They didn't see the future of God come to pass in their day. Now, it's difficult. You've got to give them consideration. <clears throat> I mean, you know, here we are after the cross, and the written word of God has been given to us, and we can sing the hymns and read the scriptures, and we know what God did in Christ on Calvary. They didn't have that. They knew that God was going to do something in the future to save their souls. They looked forward to something that God was going to do without details. And Moses was one of them. <clears throat> Verse 26 tells us, even though he had turned his back on Pharaoh and his court and turned his heart to the Hebrew people, he still was looking forward to the reward. In other words, the slaves are not going to reward him. He's not going to get anything from them but 40 years of wandering in the desert and a lot of grumbling and complaining. 
It wasn't for riches. It wasn't for fame. He was looking forward to something that he understood God was going to do in the future. Just like Abraham on the mountaintop with uh, his son when God stopped him from killing him, he said, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. It will be. It's out there in the future. Moses is just like you. He didn't understand fully, I don't think, that by taking upon the burden of leading those Hebrew people, God's people, the apple of God's eye, by taking them out of slavery and leading them to, to Canaan, I don't think he fully understood or he could have expressed it the way we have here in verse 26, but what he was doing was actually taking the reproaches of Christ upon himself. He was standing up in God's stead to be God's spokesman, to speak for God, and to act for God, and the suffering and the rejection that he received is exactly like what Christ received too, because he does the will of his Father as well. Well, verse 27 tells us, Moses by faith forsook Egypt. He left, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. you got two kings there. One is the Pharaoh, king of, of the Egyptian em empire. Secondly, you have a king in the Lord God Almighty who is invisible, who, to Moses, was unseen. Until what? Well, he had a little thing happen out in the desert. He spent 40 years out there tending to sheep for his father-in-law. And one day up upon the mountain, he saw something he couldn't explain, a bush that was on fire, which is, was not unusual. Lightning strikes and, and the other or not, but this one never was consumed. And when he approached, he walked right up to the presence of the Lord and was told to remove his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. He endured by forsaking Egypt, not fearing the wrath of Pharaoh, but he endured because he saw him who was invisible. Moses had an experience on that mountain that he never got away from. It changed him. It changed him completely because they believed but the Jewish folks, they believed if you ever saw God, you had to die. Yeah. You don't look at God and live. And yet he did in the burning bush. He was looking at God. By verse 28, it goes on because now in verse 28, he's left the, the desert and he's back over there in Egypt. He went back to get his people and lead them out. <clears throat> we know that because verse 28 tells us that by faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Now, what is that talking about? That's talking about Exodus 12. That's the last, that's the last of the plagues. Pharaoh had said no repeatedly, and what was the last plague, remember? God said, I'm going to take the firstborn son out of every family, all of them. Even the Jewish people, unless, unless you apply the blood to the doorpost of your homes, you put that over your homes and observe this Passover dinner, I'm going to teach you how to have it. And if you do that, there's an angel coming angel of death, and when he passes over Egypt, he will take the life of every firstborn child in every family, Egyptian and Jewish. He went into the land of Goshen, too, where the Jews lived. But what it tells us in verse 28, Moses heeded that. If God said that and said an angel's coming by faith, I'm going to place my confidence in him and I'm going to put blood over the doorposts of my house. He'd been, probably been there with Miriam and Aaron. Perhaps his folks were still alive. He obeyed in faith and kept the Passover. Verse 29. 
by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempted to do so to drown. Now what have we got here? He's, he's been in Goshen, observed Passover, he obeyed the Lord and did it right. Now they plundered the Egyptians and they're leaving. It's estimated there were over 1.2, I was going to say that two different ways, that there were 1.2 million Jewish individuals that left Egypt on that night and headed for the Promised Land. Well, from the Passover of 27 to verse 28, you've come to, or excuse me, verse 29, you've come to the Red Sea. They've, they've gone out into the wilderness a little ways, just a few days. They've come to an ocean, the Red Sea. They've come to a, a problem. They can't cross it. And they turn on Moses and they gripe and they complain. But Moses in faith, with the rod of God that he had, did a miracle by the power of God, and they passed through the dry sea and it was two miracles. Number one, he parted the sea. But number two, uh -huh. it was dry. Yeah. They walked on dry land. It wasn't muddy. Have you ever waded in a lake? Your feet go way down in the silt and the mud and all that? That's what they should have walked through. It's an ocean. But they walked through on dry land, it says in verse 29. And shortly after, Right after they get to the other side, it says the Egyptian army arrives. They probably saw the tail end of the party crossing the Red Sea, and they took it upon themselves to say, fire up the chariots, and let's go straight through. There's a pathway through, and it's dry. And let's go through there and capture our slaves and take them back to Egypt. Verse 29 tells us they drowned. Now what's the difference? between the Jews and the Egyptians. They're both courageous, but this is not about courage. I'd have to say the Egyptian army had courage. The account we're given in Scripture is that God parted the sea and he stood it up. It was like walls on both sides. To walk through there would require some courage. And they did it. They weren't cowards. They thought they could go through the Red Sea. But they didn't have faith. They didn't have faith, and the Jews did. By faith, it says, the Jews passed through the Red Sea, whereas the Egyptians attempted to do so without faith were drowned. Verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. I love archaeology. It's one of my passions. I just I can't read enough about it. I think I, I've missed my calling. I should have been, somebody should have given me a shovel. <laughs> told me to go out there and dig. But but I just love reading about it and the adventures and things that happen. Well, Jericho was long disputed by the uh, secular community that it was impossible that those walls could not have fallen down. And it's just a myth. Well, it's not a myth. It's the Word of God that tells us that it happened. That's, that's really all we need to say. But the Associated Press in 1992 printed the article of archaeologist Brian G. Wood with the University of Toronto. That's not a Christian school, I don't believe who excavated the walls of Jericho and walked out of there and wrote that it is exactly as the Bible said. The walls did fall down outward. And so, you know, there's no disagreement there. The point is, I like that. You probably think, so what? <laughs> but I like stories like that. But my, the basis of my faith is not that that archaeologist proved it. I don't I don't care if the archaeologist proves it or not. The Word of God is true. And the archaeologists can do all they want to to try to prove or disprove. That's up to them. That's their business. 
I have faith in the Word of God. The same Word of God that spoke to the children of Israel as they circled around the walls of Jericho seven times and then blew their horns. Yeah. That's faith. I mean, really. That's not uh, what a military army will typically do to march around the city seven times. By the way, there's women and children too. That wasn't very uh, military. The mocking and the jeering that must have happened from the walls of Jericho as they marched around, how foolish you people are. And yet on the seventh day when they shouted, the walls came down. And they came down by the power of God. They came down because someone who was unseen saw the depravity of Jericho and God moved on that city and he brought down their walls in judgment. That's why I believe the story is true. Verse 31 tells us, By faith the heart of Rahab did not perish with all of those who did believe or who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. Rahab a lady of the night, a prostitute who lived in Jericho. She saw the three spies that came from the Hebrew children, received them, brought them into her house. She hid them. She gave them information about how to conquer the city. She helped them. Why did she do that? Well, she did that because she had faith. She told those spies, we've heard about you ever since you guys left Egypt. We heard about the Red Sea. We heard about what happened to the pagan kings on the other side of the Jordan River. Your God is, is God. Your God is God Almighty. We can't stand against your God. He's the maker of heaven and earth is what she said. She had faith. So it says in verse 31, she didn't die because she had faith. Prostitute, you can scoff and, you know, make fun because she's not uh, as uh, prim and proper as we would like. But friends, I want to tell you something. She is in the bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ. This lady, along with two others, is in the genealogy of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 5. You'll find her. But she had faith, and that's, that's the point. Verse 32, What more can I say? From this time, the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and all the prophets. Boy, he just goes on and on, doesn't he? I mean, could you do children Sunday school in Hebrews chapter 11 for how long? I mean, uh, it's got every biblical story almost there is that we studied and we taught our kids. And, well, the point he's making in this, all of this, everyone that we've talked about, is that faith, the faith that God requires, has trials associated with it. It has testing associated with it. It's got some difficulties associated with it, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not unnatural that you have hard times ever so often. I don't know why, but I think I'm correct in saying all, all of us have some sort of innate uh, belief Maybe, I don't know, where we feel like, well, God, would you, I'm a Christian, and so everything ought to go okay for me. You know? I mean, we know that's not right, don't we? Well, we know that's not true. But we still kind of hang on to it. We still believe it kind of. And the author of Hebrews is writing to people that are thinking about quitting. Seriously, they're Jewish believers that life's getting tough, they're being persecuted, and they're thinking about going back. 
and just being a Jew again. It sure would be easier. And what he's doing with all these stories in Hebrew 11 is pointing out that, friend, there's a whole lot of people that have run this race before you ever thought about it. And they had difficulties. They had things happen to them, you know? It wasn't all good. They endured, and they suffered, and they had things happen to them. Gideon. Gideon is someone that put the Midianites into flight. Uh, Barak. Deborah called him out of the nowhere, really, to lead a, a fight. Uh, Samson, we all know Samson. A lot, of, a lot of stories about that boy that grew long hair and had supernatural uh, strength. But he dropped the ball a few times. He, he did some things that God was not happy about. And he was finally mocked and, and put in Philistine prison and uh, really blasphemed the name of God. He made God look impotent until his hair grew back out again. And he pulled that temple down on top of the Philistines by faith. That's why he's here listed here. David... We know about him, and we can say he was a king and a warrior, and he was a songwriter and a musician. We can say all those things, and they're true, but he's also someone that put one of his best men to death so he could steal his wife. David had to have faith, too, see? It's not that they're heroes. It's not that they're different than we are. And it's not that any of them, that you can't find one of them that didn't have trials and tests. They didn't have to press on and get through the times when you wonder what's it all about. What's next, Lord? That's what life was like for them that they all endured, he says. Verse 33. In 33, he says, talking about all these people now, okay? All of them. He said, who through faith they subdued kingdoms, they worked righteousness, they obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They became valiant in battle, and then they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. You know, they subdued kingdoms, Joshua, Judges, David. They wrought righteousness, David. They obtained promises, that's Gideon, that's Barak, that's David. They stopped the mouth of lions, who's that? That's Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den. Samson did it too. Benaniah did it. David did it with the sling. They quenched the power of fire. My three favorites, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They escaped the edge of the sword. Boy, we could go on all day. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Jephthah, David, and many, many more. Those who were from weakness were made strong. That's Gideon. Samson, King David. How about the Apostle Paul? Second Corinthians 12, 9. And Jesus said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. And that is what the author is trying to get through. That's what he's wanting the Jewish believers to understand. If you feel like quitting and going back to the synagogue, I'm telling you, just because you've got these persecutions going on, you have the opportunity for the power of Christ to rest upon you. Are you going to walk away from that? No, don't. It's not abnormal that these things are happening to you. 
It's normal. Verse 35, he says, Women have received their dead, uh, raised up to life again. Others of them were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. That is very interesting. Notice he says women received their dead back. How come he didn't say men? I mean, isn't there a Father's Day too? No, I'm just kidding with you. Did you know that most of the resurrections in the Bible were done on behalf of women? The widow of Zarephath, whose son was raised by Elijah. The Shunammite woman, whose son was raised by Elisha. The widow of Nain in the New Testament, whose son was raised by Jesus. And then Lazarus, who was raised for two devoted sisters, Mary and Martha. Isn't that interesting? But you know not everybody got raised. Not everybody gets resurrected. A lot of people lost their lives being faithful to God. And he mentions that in verse 35. Some of them uh, were tortured and they didn't accept being delivered that they might obtain a better resurrection. What's a better resurrection? I mean, would you have liked to have been Lazarus and been raised up to life again? I'm sure he would. But he died later on. That was a good resurrection, but it wasn't the best because he died, and so did all these others that I've mentioned. They ultimately died. But there's a resurrection day coming when the trumpet sounds, when Christ returns in the clouds with the host of heaven, and when he raises the dead in Christ, they're going to rise up and they're never going to die again. Amen. He's going to rapture the church, all the living at that time, up into the air. And I think they're going to be right behind the dead in Christ. But we're all going to go up in the air and meet him. And we're going to be with him forever. And we'll never die again. So that's a better resurrection according to verse 35. <laughs> Verse 36 said a lot of other people had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Well, boy, that's, that's certainly true if you've read your Bible. All of those things happened. Jeremiah mocked, scourged, imprisoned. Joseph thrown in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted and slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Boy, he's piling it on. He's got some people he loves that are thinking about quitting. And he's not holding anything back. It, uh, it hurts. He's, he's saying, I know it hurts. But there's a whole bunch of people that have gone before us that have put up with a lot more. And if they did it, we could do it too. They were stoned. Jeremiah, it says, was stoned in Egypt. Zechariah, likewise. Sawn in two. Did you see that? Verse 37, they were sawn in two. You know who they, they think that is? Very good. Yeah, they think it's Isaiah. Manasseh, uh, tradition says, had him placed in a hollow log, and they used a wooden saw and saw it in two. Some people were tempted, like Joseph. Some were slain with a sword, like Uriah. Some wandered around in sheepskins, as did Elijah, John the Baptist. A lot of them were destitute, afflicted, and tormented. I think you could put most of the prophets in that category. It was difficult for them. But I love it, verse 38. I love it, because it says, of whom all of these, the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. But notice he says they uh, had all of these things that have happened to them, 
But I say to you, this world was not worthy of one of them. And when judgment comes, and the clouds are rolled back, and the sheep and the goats are placed before Christ, and we look upon him that sits upon the throne, things are going to be made right that have been wrong here in this world. And the world is going to find out in all their pomp and wealth and power that it's these of whom the world is not worthy, not them. It's going to be a great reversal. Verse 39 tells us all of these have obtained a good testimony or approval, if you will, through what? Through faith. And all of these, he said, <clears throat> guess what? They didn't receive the promises. And that's important. All of these people, notice he says all of them. Everybody we've talked about it these last several weeks, all of them have obtained a good testimony. And that's what happens when you have faith, when you keep on and you trust God and you have faith. But he said it's important for you to understand they didn't receive the promises, those Old Testament folks, and they didn't, did they? They couldn't have told you what God was going to do on Calvary. They had uh, an inkling that something was coming, but they had no details. And here we are, and here was the author of Hebrews, on the other side of the cross, and saying we've got the details, we've got the Word of God, we've got the Holy Spirit willing to live in us and give us comfort and strength so that we too can be faithful like all these people we've been talking about here. We can do it. He says they obtained a good testimony through faith. As I've said before, be careful that you don't read Hebrews 11 and categorize all these people as he was. That's not at all what the author intended. His intention is to show you what a life looks like that's lived by faith. All right? We've, we've, we've looked at a lot of people here. And you know what? If you go back through and made yourself a list, the way their faith was expressed and worked out was different. They all had a different, different way of expressing it. And I, I was moved this week at these funerals that we had with that same thought. As I listened to the eulogies of those who had passed on before me, some of them from that greatest generation, and their lives, each one of them, were different. The way things turned out after they accepted Christ as their Savior and asked for his forgiveness, and then what happened after that, it's different for everybody. And it's different for you and me. Faith is taking God in his word and accepting his word and acting on it. Verse 40 says, God has provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Boy, is that an understatement. God's provided something better for us. Are you walking with the Lord? These Old Testament folks didn't have that. Have you, have you prayed recently and, and been prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray about something else? They didn't have that. Have you, have you sat down in a nice chair and opened up a Bible and just sat there and flipped the pages and browsed through and been blessed? See, they didn't have that. The resurrection of Christ, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, all of these things, God's provided something better for us. Those people back then, they were looking forward to something they knew was coming and they were looking forward in faith they were confident that God was going to do it and for that God reckoned them to be righteous 
and they were, they were saved just like we are, but they didn't have the details that we have today. He says God waited on them. He didn't want them to be made perfect before us or apart from us. They made it. They're in heaven. We'll be with them one day. But God's provided something better for us. Old Testament folks and you, New Testament folks, we're all children of God. And by faith, we're to walk through this world until Jesus comes. There's a kingdom coming, a messianic kingdom where he's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and he's going to rule this world for a thousand years from Jerusalem. He will administer justice and righteousness and peace. He will put all of God's enemies under his feet. And the new Jerusalem will follow where God's going to open the door and lead us in. I believe personally, show us to the rooms that he's prepared for us. And for some of you, it's going to be mansions. Right? I'm just teasing. It's an old Bible study we had. The, the future is certain. Heaven is sure. And what we have in Hebrews 11 is just simply a man saying everything those folks did that you heard about in the Old Testament, you could do it too. It's going to look different, but it's the same thing. If you will reach out your hand and take God's hand and say, by faith, Lord, I trust you, and I can't do this on my own. I want you to help me. God will work out a life for you that will be worthy to be in a chapter like Hebrews chapter 11 is. Amen. Thank you. Well, we'll be on Hebrews chapter 12 next week. And uh, look forward to being with you then. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the time we've had in the worship service and in the Bible study. We thank you for the music and the prayer, and we thank you for your scriptures. We ask you uh, this day, Father, to accept our lives, uh, all of us here individually, Lord. Uh, we want to, to live by faith. We want to have... Uh, your help to do so. We pray, we pray and ask you today, Father, please accept our hands that are outstretched to you. Walk with us this week. Show us how to live by faith like all these saints that we studied in Hebrews 11. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.